Thank you.
go. There we go. Paula's over frantically mashing buttons, flicking switches, pressing pressers, mousing, goosing mouses, mousing that gooses. That doesn't sound like something we should talk about. He was doing something. So anyway, I've got a guest here on Monday's broadcast. How often do I have to show up to where I'm not a guest, I'm just a nuisance? Well, you're, like a, guest, your you're, you're a guest on this show. Okay. Yeah. Fair. My brother-in-law is not a nuisance. He's a great guy. Sister-in-law, too. In-laws were great people. So, Dang. you're part of the family. Thank you. But you're a guest on the show. I guess you, three or four times you become a co-host at some point. Don't know. Dr. Daniel Barth. Hey, everybody. He has a new book out. That's right. What's that book? Star Mentor. Star Mentor. And it's a book that will help anyone do better outreach, right? That's right. Do okay. better outreach. And I wrote it particularly, Kent, for two kinds of people. One... The folks that are out there may be watching us, and maybe they've got their shiny new uh, Explore telescope, and maybe they have been thinking about ordering one, and they're clenching, and they're going, but I don't have anybody to help me. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a problem, because a lot of us, we would love to do astronomy. There are millions more people who would like to do astronomy who do not, because they're afraid they won't be able to master it. That's correct. They see it as difficult and cumbersome, and there's going to be math. Math makes my wife cry, y'all. So I, I sympathize. And I wrote this for you because it starts out, it does not assume anything. It, doesn't, it assumes you have a small telescope like this one or a pair of binoculars. Or a desire. Or a desire. And it will take you through learning about telescopes and binoculars. If you need that, I put that at the end of the book in case you need it. But you start out and you say, oh, let's start exploring the sky. Let's learn how to read a star map. Let's learn how to spot constellations. Let's learn how to locate things. Let's learn how to track with our telescope, which means to follow an object as it moves across the sky. And let's figure out what we're seeing in the eyepiece. The other group of people, Kent, that I wrote that for, people like you and me. Mm -hmm. Because you know a telescope is a party in a box. You go set it up somewhere, and unless you're hiding in your backyard behind a high wall, People will, people. people will find you. Mm -hmm. It's like putting out a slice of fresh apple pie on the porch and waiting for the ants to show up at the picnic. Yeah. People will find you. Mm -hmm. And when they do, they go, oh, Kent, you're such a genius. I'm sure you can help me. And I have a telescope and I can't do this. It's like, you know, you give advice, but until you get them in front of the telescope, their telescope, it's hard to help them. Well, this, you know? this book, this book, Star Mentor, you're the star mentor because you're helping other people right. learn. And it gives you the kind of structured lessons, step by step. How do I help these people learn to choose a telescope, operate a telescope, find different things, uh, explore the sky, tell the difference between nebulas and clusters, look at star, star clusters, what do the colors of stars mean? And it gives you little step by step exercises to take people step by step through Right. And it gives you a whole year's worth of observing material. And, and I can say this, a couple of Fridays ago, we did a star party in downtown Bentonville at the Meteor Cafe. And um, there was a couple that showed up, and they had a telescope. They'd seen we were going to be there. Okay. And they brought a 114-millimeter uh, a telescope from another company and had never seen anything through it. And I said, not a problem. Here's how you set it up. And I talked them through it. Now, here you do this. And I told them, okay, that's that's north and made them set it up and made them put it together and then uh, told them how to find um, uh, the finder scope didn't have a finder scope with it so I had to barrel sight using the right using just use the the lug the, the yeah, lugs that yeah. hold the tube yeah, yeah. exactly All the to time. make a sight and went to uh, the moon and so, okay, look in there. And he went, no, it's not there. And I said, okay, turn these handles a little bit. And, went, and, and he was there and he went, oh, my God. You know, and she said, get out of the way because it was her scope. Get out, elbowed him out of the way. And so showed him how it works and showed him how to track. Absolutely. And then um, I was looked over a little while later and people were looking through their scope and they were talking about their That's scope right. and looking at the moon. And then they wanted to look at something else and they went off and looked at the star and just a little bit of help, Daniel. Just a, Just little, a bit. little bit of help. That's right. And now they're Turns off. Turns frustration into joy. And I told them the key is 
to use this telescope at least twice a week for the next two months. Absolutely. If you'll do that, then if you take a break, you're still going to remember how to do it because you set right. it up and you used it. That's but you've right. got to develop that muscle memory. Right. You've got to learn and, how to do yeah. it just like anything else, like any other hobby. And I don't care if you're talking about painting with watercolors or digital photography or playing anything else. Playing a guitar is one playing thing. A guitar. Playing a guitar. You've got to play it once in a while. Otherwise, you don't hold the games. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we're looking at here, Kent, is a lot of people get a telescope and they're excited about it. And for the first month or two, they're like, ooh, good, the moon, oh, wow, and everything's new and everything's fun. And then you hit this fatigue point. And you go, but is that all there is? What do I do next? What's the next ah, exciting thing? Yeah. Show me something yep. to do. And that's where a book like Star Mentor really comes into its own. Because it's not designed like this sort of book where you have to go step by step and work your way through it like a bunch of exercises. It gives you a whole smorgasbord of things, and they're... Uh, they're designed and laid out by season. So you can go, oh, well, it's high summer right now. Let's look at the chapter on things to do in the summer. Mm -hmm. And let's see what constellations are fun to look at, what fun things are out in the sky. I was out looking uh, a couple of nights ago with a pair of binoculars, and I found Comet K2 pan stars. So did you? Yes, I okay. did. Uh, yes, uh, I Paul did. Paul was trying to find it over the weekend, and he, uh, I think he finally determined that, that there was trees. In, in his way. And I suggested the Explore Scientific Chainsaw. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's cut them down. We don't sell a chainsaw. But if you need one, uh, I can sell you one through Amazon for sure. We'll put one up in the carousel after a while. You can buy a chainsaw through. Uh, yes. So anyway. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So, how, how, okay, let's talk about the comet. Sure. You found it in what size binoculars? Uh, 15 by 70. Okay, bigger binoculars. Do you bigger think, binoculars. Do you think they could find them in a standard 10 by 50s or would it be... So, you, so not comet-like. You can. You can. I worked my way from a 15 by 70 down to an 8 by 42. But you have to understand that where my ranch is, a high atop round mountain out in the Ozarks, I have very nice sky. Yeah, so Bortle 2, Bortle 3, probably Bortle 3. To, 2 to 3. The high 2, depends, low 3. Right, depends on the night and the atmosphere, humidity, mm -hmm, all that. Mm -hmm. But Milky Way is a naked eye object for me. Right. Orion Nebula is a naked eye yeah. object. And in... Brilliantly clear skies like that, I went down to an 8x42, and with an 8x42 binocular, I can peg down to magnitude 9 So you can lower. see it. Did it look like a comet? In... No. Okay, so... No, it, it, look, it, looked like a, it looked like a globular cluster. It was right. just a little... Diffuse nebula. Slightly diffuse. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a pinpoint star, folks. It was, it was... It looked like somebody taking a snowball, throwing it against a brick wall. It was kind of... Instead of being a point of light, it was a little bit smeared out. Right. It did not have in naked eye the traditional tail. lovely cometary tail. And, and people see that there's a comet, and they expect that traditional lovely comet tail. They do. Comet Neowise had it if you looked it at did. it just right, but it wasn't much of a tail. No, <laughs> excuse me. People want, I, I, I crave... Daniel, I crave like hail Bob. a great comet. We have, we need to invigorate people into science and astronomy. Nothing like it. We and need a great comet. Now, describe to me what you think of great comet is an uppercase proper noun. Correct. That's giving to, given to comets that are fantabulous. Yes. Describe what we're talking about. You're talking about an object in itself that's probably about a kilometer across or a bit bigger. And comets like these come in, they are young objects, <laughs> relatively. Maybe the first or second time through. First or second time through the solar system because however much water and vapor, frozen carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, ammonia, methane, water ice, these ices that are on these comets, every time they pass by the sun, the comet many, loses many, mass. Yeah, many tons, many, many tons of mass are blown away and the comet shrinks, eventually the comet dies and just becomes an asteroid, just becomes a periodic asteroid without a tail. Uh, but these great comets like Comet Hale-Bopp, uh, we don't know if it had been in the solar system at all before. Yeah. And we figure it has an orbit of something on the order of 8,500 years. So it's gone probably for the lifetime of our civilization. Yeah. So, you know, but we're talking about when you hold your... A head in the sky may be the size of your thumb. 
That would be very big. You know, which that's you know, very or, big. Or pencil eraser, but a long tail. Yeah. Right. Those are. That's how I remember Comets Bennett and West in this. Yes, I was going to say Comet West. Yeah. You know, was was like. Yakataki was like yeah, that too. You know, Hakataki, Hale Bop was was it, under dark skies. Had, had a, a good group. pair of binoculars. Yeah. It was spectacular. It was spectacular, and you, you know, you're talking about maybe pinky or maybe a pencil eraser in yep. diameter, but this tail that arcs, arcs, you know, for feet across the sky. Right. I mean, fantastic imagery. Something that when you, everybody walk out and goes, oh my gosh, there's a comet, right? Whereas Neowise, if you weren't looking for it, you'd never notice it was a comet. That's correct. I mean, honestly, you. you you just go on and think it was a jet or something, a contrail way right. far away. Right. You know, I, I love those comments because it keeps people talking about science it and does. astronomy. It does. But it's also disenchanting when you find it and go, that's it? Yes. Sorry. Uh, hello, yes. Kent and Daniel and all. Okay. And I know Pekka had a couple of comments. Hello, get here so we'll all be happy. So... What? Oh, and let's it just showed up, Paul. Let's learn how to walk around at night without tripping over my telescope. Okay, Mike, there are a number of products, and uh, they are not made or marketed by Explore. I have, if you email me, I can give you some uh, references. I have a red LED light with a magnet on it, and it magnets to the bottom of my tripod. And once it does that, it illuminates. I know a lot of people have gotten little battery-operated LEDs, just little dim ones, and taped them to the bottom of their telescope legs. Uh, I've done that. I feel your pain, Mike, because teaching astronomy, students do this all the time. Oh, I want to see. Boom. And they, they're not watching. They're watching the eyepiece, not where the legs at, are. At public star parties, oh, yes. I will use uh, red LED Christmas lights. Yes. Uh, they come in a... They'll take two or three uh, AA batteries. Yes. And they're a little bright, so you can just pull out every third or every second bulb or something right. and dim them down. And I just literally run a triangle around the, around legs. the legs and go on down the road. Uh, out at Hobbs State Park where we do star parties, I have taken them and uh, put them along where the curb is so people can see there's a curb people here. People see there's a curb and, there. And, Don't but, trip. But, but again, I tell kids, don't run. No. Don't run. It's the dark. And um, the problem we face is people having to, uh, you know, using their flashlights all the time. Okay. Oh, yes. Connor Bradley from uh, England. Hi, Kent. The heat is tremendous. I got my scope inside. They're really warm to the touch. What's the best recommendation to keep them cool? It's 32 centigrade. Will the heat harm them? No. 32 centigrade is going to be 105. No, 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 no. 32 centigrade is about... 88 to 90 degrees. Is it 88 to 90? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, but not going to hurt them any. No. We face that all the time. The problem is they're facing a heat wave in England. They are. And like 5% of the houses have air conditioning. Oh, yeah. And so they're getting... My sister it's, lives in England. It's, so. it's, it's, she's getting hammered? Yeah. Yeah, by, by yeah, the heat. She says uh, it's going to be it's going to be 100. It might hit 100 here. And I said, well, we call that Tuesday. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this week... Tuesday and Wednesday, Wednesday and Thursday, Thursday and Friday. I yeah. think I saw it looked a little while ago. 104, I think, is the Connor, Fahrenheit. Connor, these, these temperatures will not harm your telescope. Here's here's the issue. As soon as it starts to get sunset, set your telescope outside in the shade. In the shade, so that it begins to cool off. Because the real issue is, as your telescope mirror cools, it contracts. Or or or, or front element, not. He, Either he's, one. He's got a refractor, so glass. He's got elements. a refractor. Same thing, though. Same thing. The uh, there's two issues. The glass changes shape slightly as a contraction. You won't get the best image. The other thing is, if you've got hot air in your telescope tube, uh, that hot air can roil with air currents. And if you have a refractor, if you set it horizontally and take the diagonal off, and that way the hot air can drain. Uh, rise and go out mm -hmm. of your tube, and when you're ready to use your telescope about an hour after sunset, it should be at ambient temperature, and your views should be nice and sharp. People with big reflectors, big Dobsonians, 10 inches and bigger, find this is true, and the old joke is, tell me if I'm wrong, the best view through a Dob is after midnight, when the yeah. mirror has had a chance right. to completely cool You off. know, big mirrors 
They take a long take a time. Long, they long do. Time. It's a lot of mass. Mac Maxitov Cassegrains and Schmidt Cassegrains take a long time to cool off too, because that corrector plate on the front is a lot thicker than you think it is, yes. and it's heavier than you think it is. Yes. And it holds heat and has to dissipate heat. But here's the deal: I don't worry about it. No. I just. If, if my telescope's been out in the trunk of a car or something, okay, I, I worry about it. But you know what? I don't sit there and wait two hours for it to cool down. I put an eye, as soon as it gets dark, I put an eyepiece in it, and I, I go on down the road. And look, if I'm doing outreach, and they see oh, Jupiter, absolutely. they see Jupiter, or the, 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 the moons of Saturn for the first time, those people don't know there's currents rolling no. through the telescope. It's, it's, they don't it's know. It's different if you're an astrophotographer if you're someone who's worried about precise image quality. But even then, with the frame stacking technology we have today, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not, not the issue that it, that it was 10 or 15 yeah. years ago. But again, if you've got the opportunity, take it, set it outside. Go you have know, a ball. Um, one thing that I've done before is put a white trash bag over it. Right? Yeah. Put a white trash bag yeah. with some holes in it so air can get in and out. That's right. But that white will help, or, or a white sheet. A white bed sheet will work. White bed sheet works Because right. it, it doesn't attract the heat like it does. If you can keep it in the shade of a tree, anything you can do to keep it out of the sun. Correct. And then as it starts cooling down, it's just going to slowly cool off. That's right. You know, air, hopefully the air temperature is going to cool down and not stay up in the 90s. But that happens, and if it doesn't, you enjoy a sweaty night at the telescope eyepiece. Ignore right? those people who say put your telescope in the refrigerator before you observe. They're just silly. So, uh, Pekka, and this is a, a something to discuss. I got my diagonal smoking when projecting the sun on the ceiling. He was using eyepiece projection to Whoa. project an image of the Pekka, sun. Buddy, you got to be careful. And uh, well, he he realized that um, you know, and he's not. I don't think it was an super expensive. One. That's good. So, you know, generally it's not going to be a problem, but when it's a problem, it starts smoking. Can we, can we point this towards the, uh, sure. so we can see the ends? Let's, let's talk, uh, Connor, uh, could I buy cooling fans for my scope if I knew the correct fittings? It's a Skywatcher daub. Um, you can. You can cut a hole in the side of your telescope right above the mirror. I would take the mirror out to do this, Connor. And uh, <laughs> yes, like, like the 12-volt... Yeah, they, the uh, fans they cooling, sell for computers. Co computer cooling fans? Yeah, you can buy them anywhere. Amazon has them. You can put a, cut a hole on one side and have put felt or something over it, you know, uh, uh, air... Cheesecloth works great, or air some, filter. Air, air filter. Air filter. You take apart a, a cheap uh, box air filter, mm -hmm. and you can take that fabric and right. use that. And you make great. a little frame sticking in so the fan is pulling air across the mirror. Right. Put the lens cap on so it's pulling cooler air across. Correct. And you want to pull it, not blow it. Right. If you've got a place for it to come in, even if it's coming down the tube, you want to pull the air across the mirror, not blow it across. Correct. Um, and Many so, people with Dobbs put their fans behind the mirror so it blows on the right. mirror our, that way. Our trust tube Dobbs actually has yes, one that blows in and one that pulls out. The yes, one that blows in is filtered on filtered. the front. That's why you don't want it blowing in because you have. You don't want it. a second dust and deposit it on right. your mirror or blow it across your mirror anyway. Because no, either one, ionic attraction is going to stick to it. Yep. And now you got to clean it. So, don't clean your mirror. That's the other thing. People see a little bit of dust or something on the mirror. And they get out the Windex and the paper towels. Just look. Don't clean your mirror. I have had a Dobsonian telescope for twenty-two years now. Mm -hmm. Daniel, you know how many times I cleaned the mirror? Goose egg. Zero zilch nada. Nunca, none. I will Have tell you, it. when I was teaching astronomy in California, I had a fleet of six and eight inch Dobsonians. Uh, I don't know, I, I think I had about 10 in my program. And these were used primarily by students, teenagers that did not own them. You know how good teenagers are at taking care of equipment that they didn't buy. Um, We're going to have to move the table, um, yep, move the table yeah, over. They, uh, <clears throat> they basically, uh, those, those scopes were still working fine. Now, I was working in the low desert where it's extremely dusty, and I did clean and collimate my scopes annually. But um, if you're not a professional, just do yourself a favor. Don't do this. You're not going to see enough change to make a difference. And you may very well damage the coatings on your mirror, and 
that's an expensive bother. You have to, if you, your the mirror dust, is damaged. The yeah. dust does Bad not day. matter. Paul, what you got? I think the best example was when somebody's mirror got shot. Yeah, McDonald Observatory in yeah. 1971 or 72, one of the telescope operators or assistants had a slight break with reality. And so he went, and, he went and got his 9 millimeter, uh, or his 38, I think it was the 38, and proceeded to unload the uh, cylinder into it, reloaded, and then unloaded more until he got tackled. He put uh, nine, uh, nine holes, nine, nine, I think it's nine holes in the mirror. Nine bullets in the mirror. And, and they thought, oh my gosh, the mirror's, mirror's destroyed. The next night, uh, the, they were out of service for one night. The next night, they did some testing and discovered that it was far less than 1% degradation. That's right. That telescope is in use today. It has, with the bullets in it. With, it has bullet holes or, or cones. And, you know, shatter cones. just shatter cones. And it's going down the road. It does, yeah, it, put a little liquid pitch a, in the, in a, the holes. Yeah. A little dust does not matter. A lot of dust does not matter. I would want to, you know, sneeze a few times would be a challenge because, yeah, but dust is not going to do anything. All right, so. Uh, so we're, we're talking about solar observing and our, our good friend Pekka and his smoking hot diagonal. Uh, I'm going to come around here. Um, this is what they call an offset mask. When you take this out, what this does is it reduces the effective diameter of the telescope uh, by about oh, one this quarter. Is down by like fifth. I yeah, mean, about a, a fifth, lot. but down to about twenty yeah. percent of its original. The thing is now, this will effectively make your telescope a longer focal ratio instrument, and you're not Pekka getting as much heat energy. So one thing, and with a Newtonian, I try to put it ninety degrees. Right, you put it in between. You can put it in between. In between the two you know, uh, put it supports. one place or the other. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to put it right there because I know where it is. There you so, go. It, and you can't tell it. No. It, it's, it's not, you don't see it. And you can make something like this out of a bottom of a pizza box. I have and done it. tape it on with duct tape. We, had, we were doing fine. a lunar eclipse at uh, Northwest Arkansas Community College up front. Sure. And it was so bright, it's like poking your eyes, self in the eye with your finger. And so I, one of the peop, students went in and found a manila uh, file folder. And I literally just, I had an 8-inch Celestron. I literally just with my knife cut out three circles and just folded it over and taped it on. Not a problem. Yep. And cut the light down by, I figure, you know, a th two-thirds, something like that. And it worked fine. A lot of people do the same thing when they're looking at a bright moon more than... More than half illuminated. Bradley, I apologize for asking so many questions, and I don't think no. Many yeah. Never apologize for asking questions. Hush, Connor. Uh, no. He said. He says, um, "Mine is a bit dusty, but it's not affecting the view." Then you're uh, right. It's not. To, yeah, we can see him, Paul. It, does. Connor. I'm telling you, I know people that are OCD. They clean their front lens elements every time. Yeah. I have my own OCD tendencies, and I will, t I will tell you what they are. I eat things like uh, M&Ms, have to be in units of four. If somebody hands me a handful of them, I sort them out by color groups as best I can. If there's one extra, I eat it. And now I have three groups of four sorted by colors. Uh, green peas don't matter because those, those are like a bulk food, but things like candy and uh, peanuts and things like that really... I also, and this is a weird one, I had never thought about it until somebody said it to me. And I was like, they said, so do you listen to the radio volumes by units of four? And I was like, darn you. Because now I have to listen to the radio volumes by units of four. No, I don't do that. Dang. But uh, Yeah, don't, don't, don't worry about being... Generally, generally you know, friends, you... Keep your telescope covered up in the tube closed when you're not using it. Mm -hmm. I just had a question this weekend. Uh, somebody said, well, I was cleaning the objective on my Explore refractor. And I'm like, oh, no. this isn't. It's one of those, you know, you hear the violins, and you know it's not going to come out well, like in a Hitchcock movie. And he said, I took all the, the lenses apart, and I got them all shiny clean with Windex, 
and now I don't know how to put it back together. Yeah, this is on Facebook. It was. Yes. So this gentleman literally took his lens cell apart. Don't do that. And didn't. Okay, don't. if you're going to do it, talk to somebody. Index them. Put a pencil mark on. Right. Yeah, I, Index I, the, the, the direction because they have to face a specific <laughs> direction. And we don't know. We're going to take one apart for him this week. Get a junker back here where it's got a crack in it or something or has bad astigmatism. And we're going to take it apart and try and figure out if you can tell because it's a crown glass. A, it's either a flint and crown or crown and flint. I can't remember which comes first. I don't. And then a yeah, fluoride element. Up. But we're going to try and figure out which ones of. Which one is which? See if we can identify them and give right. you some guidance about right. how to put it back together. Right. Because um, just don't don't do that. Don't take it apart. I can tell you, I've done a lot of cleaning and repair work over the years, and when we did this, we would we would be taking pictures, we would take things out, and we would mark the edges of the lens with a fine point uh, permanent marker, element one, element two, element three, and an arrow, and an arrow showing which way they go. So I didn't we. Didn't, I did one that the old the uh, the, the um, telescope we got from uh, Swarthmore College. Right. The the six inch f twelve finder scope. Six inch f twelve finder scope. Yeah. That's the finder scope. How big is the telescope? You ask. Two feet in diameter by thirty six feet long. It's a, yeah. It's a twenty four inch f eighteen. It's a lee wee little big. So anyway, the, when we took it apart. We did exactly that. We put a one and a two, and then we drew the arrow. A, just we didn't draw like a line with an arrow, but we put a obvious angle notch. Right. That's out. Right. And and when we did it, we it was like we were handling nitroglycerin when we did it. We, Clint and I were so scared to do it, but by golly, we did it. Now I'm I, I no problems doing it after the first time, but just don't take it apart. No, we had, don't. We had to take this one apart because it was a wee bit dirty. You couldn't see through it. That's how bad it was. So, yeah. all right. Anyway, um, so you have your show coming up. I do. At 4 o'clock on the social media blo broadcast. Correct. It's going to be on? The discovery of Neptune. The discovery of Neptune. And what does it mean if you discover something? Right. So there was a lot of people who saw and documented, including Galileo. Galileo came very close to being the first person to document this as a planet and he even showed it moved a little bit on the drawings that match up he did very good sketching and specific nights and we can go back with planetarium programs to that night and neptune is in exactly the right spots in his drawing and from one night to the next he actually showed uh, measured it it was moving a little bit he telescope was not good enough to discern that it was a Area had a disc, a disc right? Had a disc instead of a pinpoint. Otherwise, he would have discovered it purely by accident while observing Jupiter in like 16, 16 12, 16, 12 or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, but you're going to talk about that as well. So I don't want to give away the, no. the storyline. We'll talk about it more. What time is it, Paul? Okay, so real quick before we go, if we got time. Don't ever think you can pull this off and then look through the telescope oh, at the no. sun. Oh, no. Oh, Lord. You will blind yourself. You can put solar, say, film over this and no. do it. But do not ever think you can just pop this off and go, oh, and I'm going to cut down the light enough no, 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 that no, I can no. look through the telescope. Don't do that. You will, you will injure yourself. And the, the thing is, your retina has no, no nerve endings for pain. So, Ralphie, you'll, you'll put your eye out. Yeah. You will be destroying... Uh, you'll be damaging your retina before no you realize. There's no way to heal it. There's no way to heal it. All right, it's we got to go. We'll be back. Patriot Doctor.
Daniel Barth. His show is, how do you know, uh, on our social media blast that comes on after a while. This broadcast is the Amazon live broadcast. So we're going to be talking about some products here. We have a chat function up. And uh, if you want to say howdy to us, you can do that or uh, ask questions as well. Happy to uh, hear your questions, friends. Yeah. Well, we the questions make this a whole lot more fun for you and me. Yes. Because otherwise, if I'm up here just obloviating is probably a little bit strong of a term. But if I'm up here just talking for an hour, it gets dull and boring. I love the challenge of questions. Yes. You know, because... Um, you don't it, want to it, feel like a carnival barker getting people into the side show. Exactly. You want to, exactly. You want to be of service to people and, that, and help them out. That's why I try hard to make our Amazon Live broadcast an educational platform. Absolutely. Not just buy this and here's how much. Buy this, these pretty earrings. Here's my makeup. Here's the lipstick I use. Here's, which, frankly, that's what most of, of the shows are. If you go to Amazon Live, we don't do lipstick. However, we actually do have some Vixen jewelry that we got from Vixen when we got the, there is Vixen telescopes. Optics makes some, apparently some Vixen jewelry that we just haven't put up on the website. Oh, of course they do. So I, so I guess we do sell jewelry. Actually, we do sell some pretty stuff though, Daniel. We do sell many pretty things. Here's a really cool pretty thing that we have. It's up in the, in the uh, uh, carousel on Amazon Live right now. This is the Explore Scientific uh, radio control clock. That's so right. it's an atomic clock. Sets itself to WWVB, uh, which works in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, so it's always accurate. Uh, runs off of a single AA battery. This one's been running for, I don't know, five months now, probably, yeah. something like that. Uh, I've got to get myself a new one. My, my old atomic clock is so old, it has a specialty battery that you can't get uh -oh. anymore. And one of my viewers noticed, hey, Doc. Your clock's wrong. I'm like, yeah, I know. Golly. So you could just re pull the back out and rewire it, and it's a 1.5-volt battery, right? <sighs> you know, I suppose. That'd be a fun little science project. It would. But sometimes you could just buy this for $32.99 or whatever it is and have yourself a pretty Mine's not scientific that nice. clock. This is a pretty clock right here. Mine is not Very that pretty. Nice. Uh, you can talk about your uh, uh, show people in your office or uh, home that... You, you love Explore Scientific time right. right there. So we do sell a little... It's telescope time. It sort of is... Make sure that doesn't fall over. It is sort of jewelry, I guess. All right, so here we go. Huh? What? 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 Uh, I, don't I don't know, know what he said. I don't know what he said. You need so, a new butler. Yes, I do. So this is the Explore One... 20 power, which is a low power uh, binocular eyepiece, not a monocular eyepiece. It's a stereo microscope. It's a stereo microscope. Right. It's designed to look at stuff from the top. Most microscopes people are familiar with have a prepared slider, very, very, very less than millimeter, very thin slice of something that they look through to see um, the light, uh, the light from the coming bottom through. through. Right. So this is different. There was one in here. This one looked really awesome under the microscope right here. I'm going to put this up here for you, Dr. Dean, and let you describe okay. it. So this is a piece of, uh, it says gray rock. I don't know what it is, but <sighs> hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You got a tweezers? No, I can't get the rock out. This Fat, is made for kids, folks. <laughs> Fat finger syndrome. So I'm going to use my key. There you there go. There we go. All right, Dr. There you D. Go. I'm going to turn the light on for you. Thank you. So he's just going to move it around until he sees it in there, and then he's going to... And I'm adjusting the inner pupillary distance so that it fits my face. And there's one of these faces that I got. I think it's maybe... It was, there we go. That's the one right there. Oh, it's... This is... I think this is a piece of quartz. It looks... I'm not a geologist, y'all. That's just my... But the nice thing is with this type of a telescope, not only can you adjust the inner pupillary distance for everything from full adults to very young children, but when you look at this, what we call the plane of focus is fairly thin. So you can dial it. You've got a rock that's this big, and you can dial the focus up and down 
to look at different yeah. parts. So that's what I like about this one. It has a very a fairly flat surface, which it gets. Do you see the iridescence in there? Yes. Let me turn I'm the light fun. off. Just go. Does it does it show up in the studio lights? I can't remember which way. It does not. Okay, so it has that to have well. that LED on. There we go. The blue one. That's the one that did. Oh, this one did too. I can see it from. I can see it from here. Let me ink pen this time. Well, that's going to help. What do you do now, Ken? He chewed the little no, nubbin off of no, his... No, it's made that way. There's no, I can't chew a pretty perfect point like that. Eh, well, so you say. He's always breaking something. So, oh, you know, this is great. This that is... is um, these are all jumbled up. That's not quartz. No, it's, I can it's read the these. wrong color. Have a peek. Oh, yeah. Look at that. I wish we could take you all down through the microscope eyepiece to see what we're seeing here because it's spectacular. The nice thing about a, a microscope like this, everything. You don't need prepared materials. Everything is fair game. Kid can go out in the backyard with this. I want to look at a leaf. I want to look at an ant. Oh, look, here's a piece of dirt. Here's Here, a butterfly wing. Here's a butterfly wing. Oh, those are spectacular. And you can just put all sorts of things. Insect life on these are amazing. We've got a picture of a bee. Paul probably can, amazing. can get up. You can you He's, can see that bees do have four wings, and you can look at the hairs on an ant. The eyeballs it gets so are, close. On, on you can look fly. at the eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can see the eyes. Now, this is 20 power. It's not high magnification. No, it doesn't need so, to be. So the depth of field is actually thicker. That's the plane of focus. is actually thicker than on a biology microphone. Where, oh, heavens, yes. Where it's thousands of an inch thick. I mean, oh, it's yeah. just the focus is very, you know, uh, very precise. So this comes with a number of samples here of rock specimens. Daniel has clips on it too. So you can hold a specimen down? So you can hold a specimen down. Oh, you got slides. But it also comes with some slides that, you know, here is the German, let's see if you can pronounce, see if you know what this is, the Stubenfliege Kopf Total. Uh. Stupid short short wing fleggy. Is that short wing? Stupid wing. St fly. Okay. A stupid fleggy. Fly head. Cup head. Total. Total. There you go. So we're going right. to slide this in. Now glass. this is a glass slide. So I want to be a little careful. I'm going to loosen up the springs just a little bit so we don't break it. Yeah. Don't don't break your toys. Glass slides will break. The plastic ones generally won't. So there we go. Take a look at that, Daniel. I've looked through this before. Here, let me take the springs no, off. It's don't, no, it's okay. Did you move it? Oh yeah, you can see his. Oh, you can see the hairs. You can see the tongue. Yeah. And I can't tell if the, I think this is a slice. Yes. I don't think this is a whole smushed fly. No. no. It doesn't look like. <clears throat> it. Yeah. It's not shumished. It's been probably frozen. Frozen and, and sliced. And frozen, by somebody who knows what they're about, too. Fro <laughs> frozen and probably carbon dioxide. And then... Something. Sliced off, and then the carbon dioxide is evaporates, and you've got a, a Stubenfliegen <laughs> cop. Look what you I can found. see the hairs underneath Ken. the wings, and it's pretty spectacular. What would you say, Paul? Look what I found. Oh, look what he found. That is an American penny. So to give you an idea of what 20 magnification looks like. There you go. There you go. That gives you an idea of what 20 power looks like. If you got an American penny, and there's old Abraham Lincoln's head. Yep. So it gives you a real good idea of what you can, what do. You can do with this microscope. That's right. right. I would have loved, Dr. D, to have this when I was, you know, a 10, 11, 12 year old oh, yeah. out in the world, knocking oh, yeah. about and looking at stuff and looking at rocks and looking at you know, but, butterfly wings, bugs, beetles, leaves. You're, you're only limited by your curiosity and in, this in is, this. This is a very well made, for parents who may be looking out there, this is very well made. This is a, it's a metal and polycarbonate body and steel springs and a steel shaft. It has a nice rack and pinion focusing system. 
and this is rugged and robust. It's not that it's unbreakable when we talk about children and anything that's silly, but anything, sir, anything is breakable. But it's it's very rugged and under any sort of normal use, and it does have its built-in light. It's it's just uh, it's just it's a very nice system, and it has uh, there's a place for a battery underneath for your little LED, and I with that tiny LED. I don't know that you ever have to replace that battery. If that you would, turn it, it would, off, it would last for a long, long <laughs> it's time. It's probably going to start leaking. It'll after leak three the, or four years. Yeah. Before, if you turn it off and you're not using it, it'll leak before it goes before dead. Before it goes dead, yeah. All right. So we're going to look at another microscope. This doesn't have German on it, so I'm not going to try and stump you with German. This is the Discovery 900X. Biologic microscope. This is comparable to what you would see in a middle school or high school classroom. Right. This comes with a great carrying case. As you can see, it's got the, almost said the telescope. The microscope, a hatchery where we can hatch our uh, brine shrimp. Brine shrimp. Which when sea monkeys. <laughs> when you and I are kids, sea monkeys. We need to find a sea monkey ad. We do. So that Paul can show it. Okay, that's, that's we got Paul. Look for sea monkey ad and get one so we can show people that don't. Do you know, know if... You, do you know the copyright person that I can use that, you know, call Just it? Just search for Sea Monkeys and it's show It's an us. advertisement. They didn't copyright it. They put it out there. They put it out there for, for everyone to use. That's mm. right. Uh, a Petri dish, a cutter so you can make your own. Comes with red food dye and blue food dye. These are food dyes. You can eat it. If you want to make a birthday yeah. cake out of this stuff, you can do it. It's not poison. No. You're going to be fine. Paul, do I need to come forward to get focus or back? Because no. it doesn't look... Okay. You're all right. All right. So, also has sea salt, so you can make some sea salt crystals. Move forward. Some sea salt crystals. You can grow your own crystals. Brine shrimp for the hatchery. Some tweezers, beakers, um, uh, little vials, some manipulation tools. And right here are the seven prepared slides. We're going to go ahead and pull these out. And I'm going to pull out the microscope and we're going to let Dr. D talk a little Alrighty. bit. Um, very traditional with microscopes, friends, and I'm not sure if you can see this here, but we have underneath there is a mirror, and on the other side is an LED light. Actually, if you have sunlight, sunlight is going to do a much better job for you than the little LED. For a variety of reasons, it's full spectrum, LEDs are not, and this mirror and we've got lots of light in here with the studio. And sometimes I can find the mirror and sometimes I can't. Yeah, well, how's, how's the switch on this work now? Just split right, keep going around. The LED comes up and it comes on. Right oh, it, oh, it's positional. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Yeah, it's a positional switch, absolutely. And then There's you the can sea look monkey through and you I'm know, used to. You know when you got it because you see. Hang on, sea monkey ad's coming up. Oh, sea monkey ad. Yeah, oh, there it is. The $1.25. Yeah. Sea you monkeys. never get them back. I, that's the one I remember from the comic books. Yes. And I never, I've sent off my money, return you never got envelope, them? never got them. Well, that oh, was I postal did. service. My, no, parents, I did. my parents are like, you're not buying sea monkeys. That's not what they look like. Go outside and play in the heat. Okay. And I went outside and played the heat. Yeah. And then you went and saved your quarters and. Nah. You didn't? No. Oh, I did. No, I didn't. I did. I mailed off and. Uh, Check the mailbox every day. Look, my dad was, I mean, I, I, I was using power drills at five, jigsaws at five, and I think I was probably seven when I started using circular saws. Sea monkeys got outside of my wheelhouse fairly quickly because, I mean, dad was like, be careful, it'll cut your hand off. Okay, that's enough training. Off we go. Yeah. I, a very, you know, just go do it. You know, here's how it works. You know, <sighs> yeah, that's, I, yeah. Was, I was running a linotype at six and seven, a yeah. machine that has molten lead squirting out of it. Well, my dad was letting me play with that. You know, uh, being the physics instructor, uh, when my boys said, wow, that's cool, you know, they would watch uh, Mythbusters or something and they would say, oh, could we do that? And I'm like, sure, let's go to the garage. Yeah. So. We, Dad walked down the back porch one time. He says, oh, you're making gunpowder. Good. Turned around and went back in the house. 
I, we were 13 years old. He's like, good, you're making gunpowder. You know, and yep. he's just, it just, that's the way you get today. Oh, you can. Yeah. You can, but don't, don't let people get caught. Don't tell people your kids are making gunpowder because that marks them as somebody that needs to be on a watch list. Oh, dear. Yes. So, anyway. All right. So, this why is why we designed. can't wear our shoes on airplanes. Exactly. That's why I have to take shoes. No, that guy was a moron. We didn't. We never that's thought. what I was saying. We, we, never, <laughs> we never would have thought about using it for evil intent. We were using it for fun intent. Fun. Yeah, for fun. And it was fun. It was. Made a lot of smoke, though. Made a lot of smoke. Very not smokeless. Very smoke powder. All right, anyway. So, got the microscope. Uh, you got the light on. Here's a slide. Go to it. Oh, talk about the turret real quick. Right. We have a we have a turret up here. Turn, yeah, up a little turn bit. that Maybe up. See that what the better. what the turret is for, friends, is the turret rotates different magnification eyepieces, uh, objective lens in. This one is 400x, and it starts and it goes all the way up to 900x, which is really quite astonishing. So it has a 900 objective, it has a 400 objective. And it has a 100 objective. So, so Dr. D, I want to I, I, I want to see that that super magnification. I want to start there, right? No. Oh, but I want to see no. that. No. But no. start, start. No. Why not? It's it's a true thing. You always get the best view at the lowest power. That'll show you what you want to see. Number two, lower powers have sharper, crisper, higher contrast views. Number three, just in terms of finding your target. Searching for your target at 900 power is like trying to read the New York Times through a soda straw. Your From field 10 of, feet away. You know, kind of. Your field of view is so restricted right. that it's, it's very difficult. You use low power. Oh, there's what I want to see. There's the fly's eye. There's that part of the rock I'm interested in. There's that cell that looks like it's dividing. And then you slowly... After you see what you can see at low power, you bump it up, and then you bump it up. The other thing you have to make sure of to do here, friends, um, and I don't know if this is a problem with this microscope or not. This one's pretty well designed, but in any Are case... Are you talking about striking? Yes. No, it, it, it's going to get real close, and so I, think, I don't think it strikes. It's very, very close. So let's, let's play with it. Sure. Here is an onion bulb epidermis. Now, I'm giving him this because he just mentioned... I was giving him the hydrilla verticellate leaf, which is just a leaf, and you can see the cells in it. I'm giving him the onion bulb epidermis, which means the skin, the skin of, the, of onion. the onion bulb. That's the part that grows the fastest. Right. To grow, you have to have what? Cell division. division. There you go. That's right. So and I went, oh. took the one, 107 out, and I took a 24. There's a 102, eyepiece. Paul. 102, sorry. There you go. I'm not a... Anyway, so I got the 24 eyepiece. Slide it down more. Yeah, and if I would have been working with the 14, I would have never found this weird nebula that I found or whatever it was. I still don't know what it is. Yeah. but So, you know, low power is the way to go. People get a telescope and they want to go to the highest power it can go to because that sounds the more bestestest. But that's not the way you do it. So. Dr. D was having trouble finding it. I could see that he didn't have the, the uh, sample on the hole in the stage. The stage is that flat area where you put your sample. And I got moved it to the hole in it where the light's coming up. And he's, and he's like, oh, there it is. And he focused on it. Now, I will tell you that people with this microscope focus way too fast. Very slow. So, so, Dr. D, go all the way down and start. So, he's all the way down now. And he's going to turn it. It's going to come to focus about now. He sees it in really sharp focus. That's it. So you turned it a 32nd of a turn. People will call and go, it's not working. I can't see anything. And I'll say, I want you to, to focus all the way down. Put the sample in the middle. Move it around. Do you see red? Yeah, okay. Now then focus as slowly as you can without actually turning it. Or with, that, with actually turning it. Turn it as slow as, slow as you, can. you can. And it comes to focus real fast right that's what and annie did the other day she was up there fighting with it trying to find stuff and i'm just sitting here watching the screen because you know i've got my back to you sitting here watching the screen going uh focus slower i finally i finally got up and said let me do it for you 
Focus like, slower. Why? It's, it's a mistake people make. They they think it's going to be like a camera where you see it coming to focus from a long ways off, and it comes to focus and goes past, and you got to turn it a whole bunch. No, it comes to focus really fast. fast. All right, and so, goes out of focus. And once it's out really of focus, fast. past focus, you you don't see anything. No. It's just gone, right? Yeah. And so if you're focusing, on, sh <laughs> sh there's nothing there. It's not working. It's working. You just like. Like anything else, you're not working it right. You, you don't know how to use the tool. All right, so Daniel, do you see any cell division in there? I think I do. Uh, I'm looking in here, and I see a cell, and you can look and have a peek. There's a cell with a distended area in the center, and I think that's what we're looking for. And I'd have oh, to yeah. go higher power to be sure. Yeah, it's that. And it's, uh, it's just to the left of center. Yeah. Right? And yeah. It's, it's a round thing. All the others are... The cells look like bricks, mm -hmm. irregular bricks. They look like long bricks with a point on each end. Yeah. And so, but here's two or one that looks like it's got a it's a circle and a blob attached to it. So it looks like it's yeah. it's breaking off. So yeah. yeah, and you can they have materials in this kit. You can make your own slides. Get yourself a fresh onion. And just that real thin, transparent. You mean the onion skin? The onion skin that That's comes between layers. That's why it's called onion skin. Yeah. And you go ahead and you put it on there, and you can look and see what you can see. Let's do that next week. Yes, and then you try staining it with some red stain and some blue stain, and you can get amazing stuff. We can, we can. I'll work on that. I'll work on making get some onion skin and make our own slides. Yes. Yeah, and I don't. I, I've, I want to experiment with an eyepiece camera and see if we can figure out a way to hook up a live view here. That would be, be fun. so cool. We've tried. It's so just cool to smaller we, than we, there's most a way. cameras. We just need to get uh, Alex to 3D print an adapter or cut this off you right know, here so we can make an adapter that goes on it. We have one. Way. So we have a microscope that comes with a camera that yes. works fairly well. But I want to prove that this inexpensive microscope is hunky-dory, not, you know, spend $89 on one, spend $29. Now, we didn't talk about that. There you go. So right here is a filter that you can use different colors of light on. Correct. And so you can see it right here. It's clear, clear, green, red, and blue. And another clear one. And then yeah, some these, smaller these, holes. Right, the smaller holes are to restrict the aperture. Yeah. Down That's little, exactly. Down, down a little yeah. bit. Sorry. Yeah. Smaller yeah. holes restrict the aperture. That's exactly what we were talking about over there with restricting the aperture of the telescope. And it restricts the amount of light, and it helps you uh, to see uh, what you're interested in. And the colors add contrast and make they they highlight. Right. Some things and make other things disappear. You've so done you these change. things when you were a kid where you held a little red cellophane to your eye and you saw one picture and then you swapped a blue cellophane mm -hmm. you see a different thing. Mm -hmm. And why can't I see the blue lines with the red? Because those colors are filtered out. Right. And it's exactly the same thing mm -hmm. here. The colors filter out some things and let you highlight and see others. And again, this is kind of a try and experiment sort of a thing. You've got to put the filter on there and take a look and see what you can okay, do. Okay, that one's missing one because there's a there's a green one that's missing. Okay. So that, that extra hole that's just, just that's green light. Oh, look at the difference. Oh yeah, it's it's quite profound. Especially with staining, folks, because some things in the cell will pick up red stain or blue stain. Yeah. And if it's picking up red stain, you're going to see those features through a blue and a green filter. If it's picking up blue stain, you're going to see those details with a red and a green filter. Opposites attract, so to speak, I guess. Transmission right. of light. Transmission of light. All right. So um, the, the, the device comes, the kit comes with a downloadable experiment book there you go and uh, that you can tells you how to grow the brine shrimp and the salt solution to make and you know uh, how to grow salt crystals I mean Correct. it's really a, a really nice book that you can download and print in whatever language you need it to be printed that's in. right what else do you want to talk about um, Danny is mad at me 
Well, she's joined the club, Dr. D. Oh, I actually had the color wheel on the smallest hole, and that's why I could not see. Oh, all right, Andy. That would be... Um, it's, it's very much like everything else with optics. If the smallest aperture doesn't show you something, dial up to the next larger aperture. Let in more light. Let in more light. I, I just want to say, okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> She's well, not coming here whack you, buddy. You have to. <laughs> it's it's science, and the nature of experiments is we don't assume what we're going to get. We're trying to find out, and one of the ways we find out is we try different things. So with every specimen, you want to try the different aperture holes, spin the wheel slowly, and don't just go click, 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 click. That's not what you want. You want to click that into a new hole, and then you want to take some time, move the specimen around, take a look, see what you can discover, take some notes, then switch to the next setting, and again. And it's sometimes if you find an interesting area, try it with the whole sequence of colors and apertures. And take notes. See which Write one works best for you. Write it Write down. Write things down. Now, you got to remember, science is, is, is sort of like baseball. Baseball is about mastering your failure. Science is about mastering failures or, yes. or learning from failures. Because yes. if you failed, you did learn something from that, right? Yes. And so if you take notes of what failed and continuously take really good notes, you might start seeing success somewhere, or those failures may point towards some success somewhere. And I, I've got to tell you, as a science teacher and as a professor who trains science teachers, one of the things that really bothers me is this sort of a canned experiment that we get in school. Okay, um, put solution A in the beaker, put solution B in the beaker, what color does it turn? Now, Write it? your answer in this little bitty box. Green. Now dump this in and stir it around. What color does it turn? Yellow. Yellow. Yeah. Okay, science. No. No. Uh, that's science, baking a cake. That's baking a cake. That's Betty Crocker, and that's fine, but it's not science. Science says, what's going to happen? I don't know. Here's what I think is going to happen, and I write down what I think will happen. And that's called a? A hypothesis. A hypothesis. And you write down why you think so. Because if it's just a guess, say so. That's not nearly as valuable if you have an informed idea. Right. Well, I saw this before. I think this will be the same, or I think this will be different. And then you run trials, and you, you only change. You craft an experiment. One thing at a time. You craft an experiment. You do. And then you run the experiment. You do. And you change one variable at a you time. Do. And you take notes when you do it. You do. Because if you're not, Jamie Heineman on Mythbusters, if the difference between, have you heard this quote before? No. The difference between play and science? Scientists take notes. When you're doing science, you write it down. If you're not writing it down, you're just playing around. But if you write it down, you're doing science. You're doing because science. Th and, and good notes leads you to so, conclusions, right? Why do you guys get on to me all the time when I'm just like, oh, I saw this, I saw that? And you're like, did you write it down? I'm like, no. Because... Well, then, then we're relying on your memory, which I may be If you do it faulty. really quickly, it's a That's good right. memory. But if it's an hour or a day or weeks later, you know, the, yeah. how many people have been convicted? Yeah. By eyewitness testimony that was clearly flawed because the day DNA proved it wasn't them, right? In my a, a little more, a little more kinder, gentler example, in my astronomy classes, Kent, everybody has to turn in their sketches and their lab work before they leave the field. Hmm? They're not if they. I tell you, if this, if your notes see the light of day, they're no good. So, so if you, I mean, you also have the ability to go home and Google it, and then draw it, and you're going to go, gee. That's a really great picture of M13. It looks just like one taken with a, you know, the the the, the, the 24 inch telescope. Ah, where'd you? How'd you get access to that, Kent? Yes, indeedy. Not yeah. that some students would ever do that in never. college. Never, never. All right. So, um, what was I just want to talk about? 31. Oh, 31. Okay. Let's do this, Daniel. We haven't talked about this. No. Have you seen this? I have not. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Star Maker Video oh, Kit. Now, okay. Paul's like, okay. The Star Maker Video the Star Kit. Star Maker. 
comes with a clapboard so you can record your scenes in chalk at the start making it real easy comes with an LED flashlight comes with a blue green uh, chroma screen and go. the heart of the matter is the 10 pay 10, 1080p HD camera right it's astounding what they can pack with, in the small packages with a, these days with a tripod that comes with an eight gigabyte card which will hold up to an hour and a half of video doctor it'll take up to a 64 gig card which eight times eight is 64 that'd be eight uh 12 hours 12 hours of video 12 hours of video roughly probably more like 10 and a half but you know that's a lot of video that's a lot of video but look at this if i'm over there and i want to see what you're doing watch this Look at that. And so I can... B-roll. There we go. Oh, we got some B-roll up now. Here we go. There's no sound. There's no sound with it yet. So we got to look over here to see what's going on on live. Oh, okay. There she is. She's putting up the uh, the chroma screen. Look up. Look on his monitor, the top monitor. Okay. Oh, she's got the clapboard. Yep. And Man. she's... Man. So there we go. She's just hamming around for Paul's camera. I was going to have to do that. But Guy in the orange is my grandson. Like a selfie stick. Yeah, well, yeah. Exactly what it is. Yeah. It's blue and green. There you go. So this is a great little thing. It's going to be a big seller this fall. If you have kids in your life and, you know, this is for ages, I believe it's 10 and up. Teachers, a lot of times, like Eight students now. to make their own videos. Uh, Where we used to do posters yeah. as kids, yeah. they now make videos. Oh, take your phone, make a video, so, and turn so, it in. You know, at, it's 10 and up. I say 10 or 8. 8 and up. 8 and up. We know that social media is going to be a big part of your kids' lives. Oh, boy. It's just making movies, making videos. Is, is, is Get them started. This is a great way to get started. And as we saw in the video... It's a selfie stick or a raise the tripod. It has a 1.3 inch screen so you can review your videos to see if it's what you wanted and know you need to record or not. Uh, it has playback functions. It has a built-in microphone. It also has a microphone jack so you can use an external uh, wired like microphone. Like microphone like we wear. Uh, not a battery pack, but you can do wire in it. Wire or in. There's probably battery packs out there. I need to find that out that you want. Cool thing is, it has face detection, so it focuses on the faces, right? So it has face detection, all in for not a whole lot of money. You want to be a hero gift giver. You got grandkids out there or something that are in that 8, 10, 12 range. This might be the, you know, 8, 9, 10 before they get a, get a smartphone. There's a teacher you know. That, that wants one suddenly. Well, you know what? For a teacher, uh, I'm going to make a recording of your presentation. Teachers do this all the time in yeah. classrooms now. Yeah. Oh, and so they could just so you're they saying could. for a teacher Absolutely. they could just set it up here and do set it right there do the presentation to the class they can record their presentation and have it recorded pull it out stick it in the computer and done they can also you know kids do presentations i wish i could be there to see my child do history day project science fair project fine there you go do it email it home to parents there's yeah. there's your child doing great in my class that's awesome yeah mm. oh yeah educational end of it oh yes mm -hmm. oh yes and what does this retail for uh what's it over in the amazon um uh theme uh carousel, carousel. Gotta find it. Oh, okay yeah nine, 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 the, how much nine, 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 five. 100 bucks 100 bucks 100 bucks yeah that's nuts yeah you know um the green screen comes with it blue green blue screen green screen so they can play with chroma key and work with putting on artificial backgrounds it has a uh, led light that comes on bright dim and strobe effect there you go i can see it strobing right there uh it can mount on a wall and you think gee there's no way i mean look at that it comes off really easy right there's no wait a minute you can mount it on a wall look at that you can you can mount it on a and wall and because or this this uh the cup, base. cup and ball system, like your yep. hip joint, it can rotate pretty much anywhere. And you know, pull it off. It's not like it's. It's not crazy. Yeah, it's it's just strong enough. Yeah, it's not so strong. I mean, you could, if you 
you can get it to come yeah, off. It wouldn't but, take a big but, impact. But yeah, put it on the wall or on a piece of wood so you can move it around and get the light where you want it. This would be fantastic gift right here for, and, and again, you want to be a hero. I think this is going to be a hero gift come birthday or Christmas this year. Uh, so if you're joining us just now here on Amazon Live, uh, this Explore Scientific channel, we work hard to do a lot of education. Yeah, we're selling stuff, but we try to talk about education and things like that. We do. How scopes work, how microscopes work, how this works, what it can do for you. And if you have just found us and have not clicked that follow button, please do. Please do. If, you've, if you like what you see and want to get notified of more of this, you uh, can click that follow button. That follow button also helps us in the Amazon algorithm. It's really weird. The more people that follow you, the more people they give it to. But how do you get... It's that old pull yourself up by your bootstraps you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Which came first, the chicken or the eggs? Well, we got to come up with them both at the same time. That's what the answer is. That's what I've always actually thought the answer was. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Neither. The chicken and the egg came together. I mean, it just, that's sort of been my feeling. So anyway, um, let's talk about uh, your show. Yes. Is going to be about something pretty cool. The show is about, uh, this week is about the discovery of Neptune, but it's more than about Neptune. The question is, what's a discovery? Hmm. It's rarely as simple as, Eureka, I found it, I'm naming it after myself. And we think of examples like that, like Galileo and the moons of Jupiter, Darwin and his finches. They're all named Darwinii, by the way, hey, for himself. Hey, hey, Micah, you want to come join us on the broadcast? He shook his head no. Um, no. Well, Micah's our graphics artist, does a great job, or uh, does photography, does websites. websites. Yeah, so he does it. If, uh, uh, yeah, we've got to be careful what websites we say because we're on Amazon Live. Can't send people off of Amazon Live, but... He works on the website, so we yeah. appreciate so that a lot. So we'll, uh, we'll be talking about what it means to discover something. And people argue. So I discovered it. No, I did. No, you didn't. I was first. And the discovery of Neptune, uh, Britain and France almost went to war over this. It matters. It matters. Not that it much, matters. but it matters. But, you know, what, what, what astounds me about that is, is people saw it. It wasn't like somebody went, oh, that's a planet. There were people who had seen it since Galileo, the first person to really use this telescope as an astronomical device. Documented evidence, he saw Neptune. He drew it. It matches up exactly with a planetary program. He didn't know what he was seeing. But he didn't know what he was seeing. He, 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 was, he was the first guy to use a telescope, and astoundingly, he was looking at Jupiter, and Neptune, and Neptune was, was, was right there close to it. He actually drew it over the course of a couple of nights, and he showed it moving slightly just like it would have. It's an astounding idea that the guy, the first guy to turn a telescope skyward and document it, found a new planet. Found a new planet early. I but mean, not, not like he'd been doing it for years. Part of the discovery yeah. process is being aware of what you've done and then sharing exactly. it with others. So if you see it for the first time, it's a personal discovery absolutely right? and there's no dishonor in having your personal no. discovery but from I a found scientific pan, standpoint K2 pan stars right i discovered it in my backyard a couple of nights ago it wasn't my discovery it's not, it's not but like, it's my personal it's not like the this, this it's not like the the comets that david levy right has no discovered and said hey there's I'm a i'm the first right one here. in history ever to see this yeah Exactly. That that's and he's done it sixteen or eighteen times. I have discovered things before. What have you discovered? Uh, among other things, uh, a meteor shower, the okay. Earth's Majorid meteor shower, which you can't see anymore. It was a one-time event. A comet coming in broke up. My students were out to watch for the landed meteors, and if you're documenting meteors on paper, they make this brilliant sunflower pattern. They explode out from a center point called a radiant. And we found there was two centers. And we were very excited. And we, my class and I, discovered this meteor shower. Cool. But it was a comet that just busted all to pieces. And the meteor shower never came back. It was yeah. a once-off. So then I discovered something once. Sure. I was about 
six years old, was walking back from Dr. Shrigley's office to my dad's newspaper office and walked past the, the cleaners. And there was this pipe about that big around coming out, and there was, there was steam over here. But between the pipe and four or five inches, there was nothing. <laughs> I discovered plasma. I stuck my finger down and there was I'm nothing. Gonna, dude, tell me you didn't. And do. guess what I discovered? That hurts. Just because there's nothing doesn't mean there's not something. And there was something hotter than steam, and it was a wee bit warm. I stuck my finger in it and went, oh, that really hurt. And walked back to my sucking on my finger. Never told my dad until years later that what I did. But I discovered that. That was a personal discovery. Yes. And it was important. Yes. I learned my lesson that just because you can't see it doesn't mean there's doesn't not mean it's something not. there. That's right. Yes. And which is an important lesson for life. And that's one of the amazing things we think about things Galileo discovered with his telescope. There was a real question at the time, Kent. Is what I see with my eye all that there is? Yes. And we know the answer In to that. In other words, if we look with a telescope, are we just going to see the same stuff but closer? Or are we going to see more? Yeah. And you remember that famous line from the movie 2001, oh my God, it's full of stars. Mm -hmm. The Milky Way looks like this smeary band of light across the sky. It's but full you of stars. put a small telescope on it and it's full of stars. You realize this is myriad points of light distant stars, different world systems far, far away. And we need more aperture, gives us more resolution, the ability to see things that are smaller, dimmer, and farther away. Telescopes outside the atmosphere that oh see an infrared. And so, yeah, I'm talking about James Webb Space Telescope. You pick a spot in the sky where there's literally nothing, nothing. shows up on Hubble Space Telescope images, nothing. And we're talking about a fraction of a degree yeah. And stare at it for a, 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 a measly 11 and a half hours, and look what they found, it's right? It's full of galaxies. It's full of, the, this tiny little speck is full of galaxies. Extrapolate that across the entire globe of the sky. It's mind boggling. And Prediction. You know, Prediction. After we've used Webb for a couple of years, you're going to see people upping the number of galaxies in the universe. There's, there's, They're going to say, an, oh, there's, there's an, more than we thought there was. I think there's going to be, you can't count them, there's so many. I mean, it's just, there's just so many out there. Yeah. It's going to be hard to count. Now, another thing that, that I think, and, and people have sort of, they, they're talking about these beautiful pictures, Spectre is boring, right? Spectre is boring to look at. It's just a bunch of lines. You have to bring a lot of knowledge to it to right. make it exciting. Right. And the fact that the first exoplanet that transited the star and they measured the spectra of the atmosphere showed many forms of molecular hydrogen, or I mean hydrogen, H, and O2, and showed not water, but there was some signatures of actual H2O. There's various forms of oxygen in the spectra hydrogen, oxygen, and some other minor elements. And I predicted, in writing, before it came out... I remember, I was here. I predicted in writing, before it came out, that the specter, because they were talking about it, I knew it had to be something, is going to show oxygen, I said water, and carbon. And, I'm, and I should have thought, you know, a little bit more, carbon is going to, in the atmosphere, is going to indicate probable CO. life, CO potential, possibly a carbon-oxygen cycle. A lot of the carbon could be on the surface of the star. I was half right. We got water, right? Hydrogen, oxygen, and no carbon yet. You but realize we're sampling, effectively sampling the atmosphere of a planet almost 40 light years away. Yeah, yeah. We can, we can, we can look at it and go, oh, and, and once you understand how, how how the suspector works, specific elements give off a, a light at a very specific wavelengths. That's why the auroras are red and green and blue. That's right. Because it's specific gases, noble gases, elemental gases, giving off light when they're excited. Yep. The same thing happens. If it's absorbed, then that's an absorption line. If it's a 
given off. It's a what's the opposite of a, I'm drawing a blank. It's an emission line. Emission. Thank you. Drew a blank. And so we know from all the elements we've got spectra of Fraunhofer lines and Kirchhoff lines. Right. And we know what those are. And we simply just have to match them up and go, oh, those match up. Here they are. This is what they are. And we can also measure the redshift on them, yep. which tells us the distance. Because the farther the redshift, the more distance. Doppler effect, basically. Right. So I don't really think that spectra has, gotten, has, gotten, has gotten the uh, love that I think it deserves. No. Because of what it shows, and just the mind-boggling, we're able to measure what's in the atmosphere of a planet 40 light years away, Stunning. and that's that's the tip of the iceberg. Now then, Stunning. I, we can't say that's the first spectra. That's the first one they released. My guess is they took numbers of spectras. And they're going to be taking more. Yeah, and they picked the one that goes, oh, this is the one we're going to tell the public about, right? Probably. But so they picked the best, and this is doing science. Pick your best targets and focus on those. Don't just, if you, if you want to do a random thing, you can do a random thing. But if you want to try and discover something, pick your best thing. That's why there was so much effort put forth to map the moon in the 60s, 50s and 60s, to pick a place for the, the Apollo land. landing. Where are we going to put them to discover the most stuff we can? Same thing with where we land on Mars so much effort is going through there. So, Caitlin Aaron, you know Caitlin, right? Yes. You know what she's doing now? Caitlin Aaron graduated from the U University of Arkansas. She ran with a deg degree, a doctorate in something. She's doing postdoctoral work, doctorate work now. She works for uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. Right. And she's doing uh, modeling and research on the permanently shadowed lunar craters to help decide which crater we should go to. That's cool. You know, a girl graduated from the University of Arkansas. Ran the Pluto lab. Oh. Yeah, boom. You know, it's just about being curious. You know, it's about, you, you know, and learning. And don't be afraid to fail because science is about failure. You know, and learning from your failures. It is. And if it didn't kill you, you learn from it. You did. So, all right. So, let's talk a little bit about this telescope. This is a 114 millimeter Newtonian telescope. Paul, do we have any chats going on right now? We haven't seen any. I want to make sure because we're not seeing any pop up. So if you're here, we're on for another, oh, 10 minutes or so. We would love for you to give us a shout out and say hello to us. Uh, Pekka, yeah, an amateur astronomer reaching and yelling at the, at, after at least 50 inch Dobsonians with golden coatings. Well, you know, a 50-inch daub, I, I actually have, it wasn't a daub, it was a Newtonian, uh, but looked through, through an eyepiece, through the Struve telescope on the McDonald Observatory, has a six-foot mirror. Yes, indeed, folks. The, the widest view we could get with the eyepieces that they brought was, Daniel, a third of a degree. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was fantastic. Uh, we actually saw the 12th planet that Michael Brown discovered and then said it's not a planet. We saw it. It was magnitude 19. Limiting magnitude that night was magnitude 19.3. It was like a lightest shade of dark, but we all saw it. There you um, go. And it was a fantastic night using that telescope. Uh, we stayed all night. We're the first people to ever stay all night, the professional astronomers that ran the telescope said. Uh, and uh, we were done. It wasn't, the sun was kind of, it's not up yet, but getting dark. And they said, well, we, they'd looked at their entire list of things that we had looked for. And I said, let's look at M42. And they were like, why would we want to look at M42? And I said, what else are we going to look at? So they slewed to M42, and you, you couldn't see, I mean, the trapezium was astoundingly too big. The trapezium is a little star pattern in the very center of the uh, Orion Nebula. And we were seeing yellows and blues and greens and little tendrils with little planetismals you could see. It was truly astounding. The first guy that slewed to it, he, he, he said a comment I probably shouldn't say, but it was holy something or other. And nobody believed it. And of all the people, uh, and I still talked to a couple of the guys uh, from the St. Louis Astronomy Club that were there, and that's the thing they talk about is what that looked like in that telescope. 
uh, was truly mind-boggling that you could n actively see yellows and greens and reds and these little pillars of creation in an eyepiece of a really big telescope. So, Pekka, it is pretty cool to get out there with a big telescope. It is. If you're watching us and give us a follow, we'd love to pick that up and thank you for it. Um, so, this is a small telescope on an equatorial mount. We're not going to go into details about how to polar alignment other than tell you this axis right here has to be pointed at either the North Celestial Pole or the South Celestial Pole. Daniel, what does that do for us when we point that axis? At when you do that, that means that the telescope can rotate exactly the way stars rotate around the Celestial Pole. And so with one knob, you can track things like planets as they move. Because one of the problems, folks, is when we magnify the sky, we magnify the motion in it. Just as much. Correct. If you're looking at Jupiter at 150 power, you're speeding up its apparent motion by 150 times. And at science, at astronomy labs and outreach, people tell me, I've lost the moon, I've lost Jupiter, it went away, it drifted out of the eyepiece. Well, you have to, basically what we're doing is we're counteracting the rotation of the All Earth. Right. The Earth turns this way, we're turning the telescope that way, so we stay pointed at the same target. And one knob properly lined up, one knob does that for you, and it's easy. You're at the eyepiece, and you just you, you dial it a little yeah. bit. Use, they're called slow motion control. Slow arms. motion control. Right. So this is called right ascension. You it's know, the polar axis. It's the polar axis. It it is the lines up with the uh, axis of the Earth. How do you know where to put it at? Well, find out the latitude where you live, right here in northwest Arkansas. We're just a wee bit over 36. Yep. So you just there's a scale on the side of every equatorial mount. You just put it to 36, and now you've got that part of it done. Now you just have to figure out where the north celestial pole is, which if you can see Polaris, you just wait for the sun to go down and go, oh, yeah, there's Polaris, and point it, get it lined up. The more you do it, the better you get. I have a way uh, where I use a compass and yep. find magnetic north, and then understand <coughs> the magnetic north is not true north. Same for south. I use the northern hemisphere, but our friends in the south that watch southern hemisphere, you, you have to do the same thing right. because there is no guide star. There's nothing close to the southern celestial pole nope. that you can use. So you find out where north is, and here in northwest Arkansas, our magnetic north is about one degree west of true north. Correct. But if you get out on the Pacific coast, you're 15, 16 degrees. You get up in yep. Maine, you're 15, 16 degrees. So we have a question coming in, apparently. So you've got to uh, uh, understand that magnetic difference to line it up with a, with a uh, uh, yeah, uh, compass. We have a question. Is it possible to manufacture narrowband filters for visual observation? Yes. And they're marketed under various names. But you can get what's known as an oxygen-3 filter. We have and we that's, sell those. You I'm sure you do. Explore sells these. I just don't know what the product name is from Explore, but Oxygen Three filters O3, cut out right? sky, sky glow. Right. There's light also pollution, a light uh, pollution LCS, <coughs> LPS filters, things like that. They also are narrow band filters. Uh, there are filters specifically to cut out um, artificial lighting, right. metal halide, and uh, <coughs> uh, low pressure sodium. L right. Know. And you know we sell a number of those filters. Right. You can find them over. They may not. They're not in our carousel, but here on Explore, uh, on the uh, Explore li uh, Amazon Live broadcast, you can go to the Amazon store and search uh, for Explore Scientific and filters. And there's a whole host of them. those as well. So, all right. Well, we're getting the shutdown sign. I'm gonna. I'm gonna steal a couple more minutes. Just talk about the other axis here. This mount also has another axis on it. it. Helps if we lock the right one and unlock the right one. This one is sort of think of it as up and down. North south. North south. The other axis takes you east and west. Right. This is I think of it as up and down. These two work in concert with each other to point at an object. So if I want to point at something in the southwestern sky, right there, I'm pointing in the southwestern sky. Notice my telescope is on the east side because this is north. This is the east side. 
but I'm looking west. Why? Because that's how this system works, right? And if I want to look at something in the southeast sky, then it's real simple. I'm just going to have to turn the telescope around and get it pointed the, it, with the it telescope. It becomes intuitive yes. after you practice for a while. Right. And it, the first few times, it's very difficult. Uh, it's, it is a challenge if you don't understand and have at least a basic idea of the principle of how this is going to work, right? But once you get it, it's real simple, and it's hugely effective. All right, we have a question. I thought they were for astrophotography. Not necessarily, Some of no. them are. Some of them are so narrow <coughs> that there's, or you have to have such dark skies to see anything. You know, you can't hold them up and see anything. No. Um, but they are letting light through. But you have to have dark enough skies to where you're going to see something. If you have any light pollution around that's causing your pupil to get bigger or to get smaller, you're not going to see them. So, Daniel, we've got to go. We it's do. 3 o'clock. Thank you for watching us. We'll be back tomorrow with uh, Fun Day Tuesday. For lack of a better title, they haven't come up with it, so I'm going to go with that. Annie and Lucy talk about some of the great educational products that we have. There you go. Uh, and then Wednesday is uh, First Light Chronicles. We talk about first light things, telescopes, all sorts of stuff. And the 100th Global Star Party is coming Oh, up. yes. Tuesday night, the 100th Global Star Party is coming up. We have to be careful what we say uh, because Amazon robots don't like us doing that. But we have the 100th Global Star Party coming up on Tuesday. And then Thursday is On the Wing. I'll be talking about our fine feathered friends. And Friday then is Focus on Astrophotography. I will not be with you next week on uh, anywhere close to a regular basis. So, Daniel, you may be in here pitch hitting with Tyler or somebody. Nobody's I will be, called me for that assignment yet. I, I, will, I will be going to the Nebraska Star Party where I you. will be doing some, if we have enough signal i'll be going live from there a little awesome. bit and i may try and come up uh at night a few times with scott just talk about it okay or do you mean that i can see all the blue gases around m45 with o3 visually probably not probably not um those tendrils of gas you're talking about are very very faint and a camera you open the aperture and or it collects shutter. light like yeah. a bucket out in the rain. Yeah. Your eye sees photons as they come in, and basically it's an instantaneous detector. It doesn't collect right. anything. So what it does is they, they will increase contrasts at the eyepiece. Correct. Is how, how I have experienced. Correct. A peck of the reality is I don't use the filters. I've, you know, I'll use a neutral density on the moon every once in a while, but I just... You know, it's one more piece of kit that I have to mess with. I use if filters I was, pretty extensively. Yeah, do you? So yeah, that's yeah, I just I use, you use I have colored a, filters. I have a set of colored filters that I use primarily for planetary right. observing. Right, which is and what those are meant for. I have a neutral density for the moon and I have a, a deep sky filter. I will tell you I use colored filters for planetary work more often than I use deep sky. Right. Right. That I'll agree with that. Yeah. So we got to go. It's 3 o'clock. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye, everybody. We appreciate you sharing your time with us. It's a blessing to us to have you watch. That's right. On behalf of everybody here at Explore Scientific, including Paul Newton, the disembodied voice over in the control room, and Noah Menard, the Amazon guy. Hey, Noah, give us a wave, would you? He waved like this tonight. Just like that. That's how it looked when he saw him. Uh, and my sidekick here. Dr. Barth, always a good time to get him on the show. Absolutely. Uh, much more educational. It's a lot nicer to have somebody to talk to. I appreciate it, sir, very much. You so, We're out of here. What's yeah, that, Paul? I'm like chop liver, I guess. No, you push the buttons. You make it happen. You said you'd like to have somebody to talk to. See. On stage. I mean, on stage to talk to. It's. It's Just hard saying. to talk to somebody who's sitting comfortably in a chair. Let, sipping, me, en let me enjoy this. It's so soda. rare anybody's jealous of me for anything. <laughs> sipping, <laughs> sipping a soda over there. If he wants to eat lunch, he can eat I lunch or snack no or whatever. Ah. I got lemonade. Okay, shake it up. Now it's soda. It's not <laughs> soda. There's no carbon in there. Bye, everybody. Bye now.